in strong communities. It is an investment in the future of so many forgotten paths in America. My brother teaches at Pine Richland High School in Gibsonia, just north of here, the same high school we both went to. The kind of investment Joe Biden is talking about would mean so much to his school and to his students, both now and in the years to come. For example, President Biden proposes a massive expansion of high-speed broadband, and that's critical to the health of so many small towns in this area. I've got two little kids at home myself, and I don't want to see them leave the area or even the state to find opportunities. The Build Back Better plan is directed at communities like mine. It's about opening up opportunities, revitalizing local businesses, and creating jobs. For decades, Pennsylvania was a global leader in manufacturing and good union jobs. It can be that way again, as President Biden has a solid plan to make that happen. I also don't want my kids growing up in a world where the threat of climate change hangs over their heads. That means investing in electrical vehicle charging infrastructures and all forms of clean power technology so we can slash carbon emissions and create tens of thousands of green energy jobs, union jobs. And that's exactly what President Biden is proposing. Here's another reason I'm so excited about this. I'm 100% a union guy. It is in my blood. The union changed my life, and it gave me opportunities I could never have dreamed of. Being a line worker isn't always easy, but thanks to my union, I enjoy a great paycheck, strong health and retirement benefits, and a voice on the job. Here's who else is a union guy, Joe Biden. And he said again and again, unions built the middle class. That's why his plan supports collective bargaining rights, it supports a living wage and making sure the taxpayer money goes to supporting American-made manufacturing. The men and women of the IBEW are ready to get to work rebuilding our infrastructure, retooling our plants, and revitalizing our communities and the middle class. We're ready to build America back better. So it is my pleasure and it is my honor to introduce the President of the United States, Joe Biden. Thank you. Gov Mike asked me and uh, say to Bobby, my good friend, he asked me back there, he said, do you ever get nervous? And I, he said, because I got up this morning, made breakfast for my kids, so I got to introduce the president. And what I say to you, Mike, you did a heck of a job, but I'd get nervous if I had to get up in the middle of the night, climb up a telephone pole, replace in the middle of a storm a connection that knocked out everybody's electricity, put a transformer in. That's what made, would make me nervous. So uh, what you did was really good. I couldn't do what you do, pal. I couldn't do what you do. And uh, I want to uh, — and it's true, Mike, you're a union guy? Me too. I got in trouble, but I don't make any apologies for it. I'm a union guy. I support unions. Unions built the middle class. It's about time they start to get a piece of the action. To all my colleagues, from the county executive to the mayor, to everyone that's here, I want to say thank you. Thank you, Congressman, for the, uh, for the uh, passport in your district, and I appreciate uh, being here. Uh, I'm honored to be with you. Two years ago, I began my campaign here in Pittsburgh, saying I was running to rebuild the backbone of America. And today, I return as your president to lay out the vision of how I believe we do that, rebuild the backbone of America. It's a vision not seen through the eyes of Wall Street or Washington, but through the eyes of hardworking people, like the people I grew up with, People like Mike and his union family, union workers and his carpenter's training center, people like the folks I grew up with in Scranton and Claymont, Delaware, people who get up every day, work hard, raise their family, pay their taxes, serve their country, and volunteer for their communities, and just looking for a little bit of breathing room, just a little bit of light. 
ordinary Americans doing extraordinary things, people who break their necks every day for their families and the country they love, a country that, in fact, uh, which on the day I was elected was in extreme distress with the virus on a deadly rampage that has now killed over 4,000 — excuse me, 500 — I carry it in my pocket every day. I have the list of exactly how many have died. 547,296 Americans dead from the virus. More than all the people killed in World War I, World War II, the Vietnam War, 9-11, 547,296 Americans, and an economy that left millions out of work and created so much anxiety. That's why I moved so quickly to pass the American Rescue Plan with the help of my friends here in the Congress. I really mean that. It didn't pass by a whole lot, but with the leadership of Connor and Bobby and the Mayor, just you got it done because it was an emergency. We needed to act to save jobs, to save businesses, to save lives. And that's what we did. We're beginning to see the results. We're on our way to having given 200 million vaccination shots in the first 100 days of my presidency. When I said I'd get 100 million done, people thought it was a significant exaggeration. We're going to get 200 million done, twice the original goal because of all the help of all of you. Leading economists are now predicting our economy will grow 6 percent this year. That's a rate we haven't seen in years and years. We can cut child poverty in half this year. With the American Rescue Plan, we're meeting immediate emergencies. Now it's time to rebuild. Even before the crisis we're now facing, those at the very top in America were doing very well, which is fine. They were doing great. But everyone else was falling behind. The pandemic only made the division so much worse and more obvious. Millions of Americans lost their jobs last year, while the wealthiest 1 percent of Americans saw their net worth increase by $4 trillion. Just goes to show you how distorted and unfair our economy has become. It wasn't always this way. Well, it's time to change that. I note parenthetically that I got criticized for giving tax breaks to middle class and poor folks this last time. I didn't hear that cry, you and cry, when we were doing the same thing when Trump's tax bill passed, 83 percent of the money went to the top 1 percent. You know, this is not to target those who made it. <clears throat> not to seek retribution. This is about opening opportunities for everybody else. And here's the truth. We all will do better when we all do well. It's time to build our economy from the bottom up and from the middle out, not the top down. That hadn't worked very well. For the economy overall, it hadn't worked. Because Wall Street didn't build this country. You, great middle class, built this country, and unions built the middle class. And it's time, <clears throat> and this time, when we rebuild the middle class, we're going to bring everybody along, regardless of your background, your color, your religion, no matter. Everybody gets to come along. So today, I'm proposing a plan for the nation that rewards work not just rewards wealth. It builds a fair economy that gives everybody a chance to succeed, and it's going to create the strongest, most resilient, innovative economy in the world. It's not a plan that tinkers around the edges. It's a once-in-a-generation investment 
in America, unlike anything we've seen or done since we built the interstate highway system and the space race decades ago. In fact, it's the largest American jobs investment since World War II. It will create millions of jobs, good-paying jobs. It will grow the economy, make us more competitive around the world, promote our national security interests, and put us in a position to win the global competition with China in the upcoming years. It's big, yes. It's bold, yes. And we can get it done. It has two parts, the American Jobs Plan and the American Families Plan. Both are essential to our economic future. In a few weeks, I'll talk about the Americans' Family Plan. But today, I want to talk about the Americans' Jobs Plan. I'll begin with the heart of the plan. It modernizes transportation infrastructure, our roads, our bridges, our airports. I just left your airport. The director of the airport said, we're about to re renovate the airport. Is that right, Mr. County Executive? We're going to renovate. We're going to employ thousands of people. And she looked at me and said, I can't thank you enough for this plan. It grows the economy in key ways. It puts people to work to repair and upgrade so that we badly need. It makes it easier and more efficient to move goods, to get to work, and to make us more competitive around the world. Some of you local officials know when someone wants to come in the area and a company wants to invest, what do they ask? Where's the first rail bed? How can I get to the railroad? What access to the interstate do I have? What's the water like? Tell me about it. It goes on and on. It's about infrastructure. The American Jobs Plan will modernize 20,000 miles of highways, roads, and main streets that are in difficult, difficult shape right now. It will fix the nation's 10 most economically significant bridges in America that require replacement. Remember that bridge that went down? We got 10 most economically significant bridges with more commerce going across it that need to be replaced. We'll also repair 10,000 bridges, desperately needed upgrades to unclog traffic, keep people safe, and connect our cities, towns, and tribes across the country. The American Jobs Plan will build new rail corridors and transit lines, easing congestion, cutting pollution, slashing commute times, and opening up investment in communities that can connect it to the cities and cities to the outskirts where a lot of jobs are these days. It will reduce the bottlenecks of commerce at our ports and our airports. The American Jobs Plan will lead to a transformational progress in our effort to tackle climate change with American jobs and American ingenuity, protect our community from billions of dollars of damage from historic superstorms, floods, wildfires, droughts, year after year by making our infrastructure more secure and resilient and seizing incredible opportunities for American workers and American farmers in a clean energy future. Skilled workers, like one we just heard from, building a nationwide network of 500,000 charging stations, creating good-paying jobs by leading the world in the manufacturing and export of clean electric cars and trucks, we're going to provide tax incentives and point-of-sale re re rebates to help all American families afford clean vehicles of the future. The federal government owns an enormous fleet of vehicles, which are going to be transitioned to clean electric vehicles and hydrogen vehicles right here in the United States of America by American workers with American products. When we make all of these investments, we're going to make sure, as the executive order I signed early on, that we buy American. That means investing in American-based companies and American workers. Not a contract will go out that I control that will not go to a company that is an American company with American products 
all the way down the line, and American workers. And we'll buy the goods we need from all of America, communities that have historically been left out of these investments. Black, Latino, Asian American, Native Americans, rural, small businesses, entrepreneurs across the country. Look, today, up to 10 million homes in America and more than 400,000 schools and child care centers have pipes where they get their water from, pipes that are lead-based pipes, including pipes for drinking water. According to scientists, there is simply no safe exposure to lead for a child. Lead can slow development, cause learning behaviors, and hearing problems. The American Jobs Plan will put plumbers and pipe fitters to work, replacing 100 percent of the nation's lead pipes and service lines. So every American, every child, can turn on a faucet of our fountain and drink clean water. With each $5,000 investment replacing the line, that can mean up to $22,000 in health care costs saved. A chance to protect our children, help them learn and thrive. We can't delay. We can't delay another minute. It's long past due. You know, in America, where the early interest was in Internet, this thing called the Internet that we invested, we, in, we, in, we invented the early, early Internet. It was invented here. Millions of Americans, though, lack access to reliable high-speed Internet, including more than 35 percent of rural America. It's a disparity even more pronounced during this pandemic. American jobs will make sure every single, every single American has access to high-quality, affordable, high-speed Internet for businesses, for schools. And when I say affordable, I mean it. Americans pay too much for Internet service. We're going to drive down the price for families who have service now and make it easier for families who don't have affordable service to be able to get it now. As we saw in Texas and elsewhere, our electrical power and power grids are vulnerable to storms, catastrophic failures, and security lapses with tragic results. My American Jobs Plan will put hundreds of thousands of people to work, hundreds of thousands of people to work, line workers, electricians, and laborers laying thousands of miles of transmission line, building a modern, resilient, and fully clean grid, and capping hundreds of thousands of, oh, oh, literally, orphan oil and gas wells that need to be cleaned up because they're abandoned, paying the same exact rate that a union man or woman would get having dug that well in the first place. We'll build, upgrade, and weatherize affordable energy-efficient housing, commercial buildings for millions of Americans. Even before the pandemic, millions of working families faced enormous, enormous financial and personal strain trying to raise their kids and care for their parents at the same time, the so-called sandwich generation, or family members with disability. You've got a child at home. You can't stay home from work to take care of that child unless you lose you're going to have the child's at risk or you lose your job, or you have an elderly parent you're taking care of. 
and seniors and people with disabilities living independently feel that strain as well. But we know if they can remain independently living, they live longer. The American Jobs Plan is going to help in big ways. It's going to extend access to quality, affordable home community-based care. Think of expanded vital services like programs for seniors. Or think of home care workers going into homes of seniors and people with disabilities, cooking meals, helping them get around their homes, and helping them be able to live more independently. For too long, caregivers who are disproportionately women and women of color and immigrants have been unseen, underpaid, and undervalued. This plan, along with the American Families Plan, changes that with better wages, benefits, and opportunities for millions of people who will be able to get to work in an economy that works for them. You know, decades ago, the United States government used to spend 2 percent of its GDP, its gross domestic product, on research and development. Today, we spend less than 1 percent. I think it's 7 tenths of 1 percent. Here's why that matters. We're one of only a few major economies in the world whose public investment in research and development as a share of GDP has declined constantly over the last 25 years. And we've fallen back. The rest of the world is closing in and closing in fast. We can't allow this to continue. The American Jobs Plan is the biggest increase in our federal non-defense research and development spending on record. It's going to boost America's innovative edge in markets where global leadership is up for grabs. Markets like battery technology, biotechnology, computer chips, clean energy, the competition with China in particular. Critics say we shouldn't spend this money. They ask, what do we get out of it? Well, they said the same thing when we first flew into space for the first time. They said the same thing. Well, pushing the frontiers led to big benefits back home. When NASA created Apollo's digital flight control system, unheard of at the time, it led to technologies that help us today to drive our cars and fly our planes. When NASA invented ways to keep food safe for the astronauts, it led to programs that have been used to, for decades to keep food safe in supermarkets. At least 2,000 products and services have been developed and commercialized as a result of American space exploration. GPS has helped us find each other. Computer chips allow us to see and talk to one another, even when we're separated by mountains and oceans, singing happy birthday and watching the first steps of that new baby grandchild, comforting each other when comfort is needed. Think about it, what it means to you and your loved ones. We just have to imagine again I had a long discussion with Xi Jinping, leader of China, and he called to congratulate me. We spent two hours on the phone. And he said, and I was astonished, my NASA security team and the China experts who were on the line, he said, you've always said, Mr. President, that you can define America in one word, possibilities. That's who we are. In America, anything's possible. Like what we did with vaccines a decade ago that laid the foundation for COVID-19 vaccines we have today. Like we did when the interstate highway system that transformed the way we traveled, lived, worked, and developed. Americans could visit relatives anywhere in the country with just a family station wagon. Business here in Pittsburgh could load up a truck, get a product to Portland or Phoenix. To this day, about a quarter of all the miles Americans drive each year on one of those very original highways. Imagine what we can do, what's within our reach when we modernize those highways. You and your family could travel coast to coast without a single tank of gas on board a high-speed train. We can connect high-speed, affordable, reliable internet wherever you live. Imagine knowing that you are handing your children and grandchildren a country that will lead the world in producing clean energy technology and will need to address one of the biggest threats of our time. That's what we'll do. All together, along with the American Rescue Plan, the proposal I put forward will create millions of jobs. 
estimated by some Wall Street outfits over 18 million jobs over four years. Good paying jobs. It also works to level the playing field, empower workers, and ensure that the new jobs are good jobs that you can raise a family on and ensure free and fair choice to organize and bargain collectively. That's why my plan asked Congress to pass the Protecting the Right to Organize Act, the PRO Act, and send it to my desk. This plan is important, not only for what and how it builds, but it's also important to where we build. It includes everyone, regardless of your race or your zip code. Too often, economic growth and recovery is concentrated on the coast. Too often, investments have failed to meet the needs of marginalized communities left behind. There is talent innovation everywhere. And this plan connects that talent through cities, small towns, rural communities, through our businesses and our universities, through our entrepreneurs, union workers, all across America. We have to move now, because I'm convinced that if we act now, in 50 years, people are going to look back and say, this was the moment that America won the future. What I'm proposing is a one-time capital investment of roughly $2 trillion in America's future, spread largely over eight years. It will generate historic job growth, historic economic growth, help businesses to compete internationally, create more revenue as well. They are among the highest value investments we can make in the nation investing in our infrastructure. But put another way, failing to make these investments adds to our debt and effectively puts our children at a disadvantage relative to our competitors. That's what crumbling infrastructure does. And our infrastructure is crumbling. We rank 13th in the world. What's more, it heightens our vulnerability to uh, an attack attracts our adversaries to compete in ways that they don't have them up to now. And our adversaries are worried about us building this critical infrastructure. Put simply, these are investments we have to make. We can afford to make them. Or put another, we can't afford not to. So how do we pay for it? I spoke to the majority leader. I no longer, I guess he's no longer the majority leader. <laughs> he has been for a long time. I spoke for the Republican — I spoke to the Republican leader about the plan. Everybody's for doing something on infrastructure. Why haven't we done it? Well, no one wants to pay for it. Less than four years ago, as I said, the Congress passed a tax cut of $2 trillion, increasing the national debt $2 trillion. It didn't meet virtually any of the predictions it would in terms of growing the economy. Overwhelmingly, the benefits of that tax package went to the wealthiest Americans. It even included new investments that would you profit by shifting profits and jobs overseas if you're a corporation. It was bad for American competitors, deeply unfair to the middle class families, and wrong for our future. So here's what I do I start with one rule no one, let me say it again, no one making under $400,000 will see their federal taxes go up, period. This is not about penalizing anyone. I have nothing against millionaires and billionaires. I believe American American capitalism. I want everyone to do well. But here's the deal. Right now, a middle-class couple, a firefighter and a teacher, with two kids making a combined salary of, say, $110,000, $120,000 a year, pays 22 cents for each additional dollar they earn in federal income tax. But a multinational corporation that builds a factory abroad, brings it home and sells it, they pay nothing at all. We're going to raise the corporate tax. It was 35 percent, which is too high. We all agreed five years ago it should go down to 28 percent, but they reduced it to 21 percent. We're going to raise it back to we're up to 28 percent. No one should be able to complain about that. It's still lower than what that rate was between World War II and 2017. Just doing that one thing will generate $1 trillion in additional revenue over 15 years. In 2019, an independent analysis found that there are 
91, let me say it again, 91 Fortune 500 companies, the biggest companies in the world, including Amazon, that use various loopholes so they pay not a single solitary penny in federal income tax. I don't want to punish them. That's just wrong. That's just wrong. Farmer and teacher paying 22 percent. Amazon and 90 other major corporations paying zero in federal taxes. I'm going to put an end to that. Here's how we'll do it. We're establishing a global minimum tax for U.S. corporations of 21 percent. We're going to level the international playing field. That alone will raise $1 trillion over 15 years. We'll also eliminate deductions by corporations for offshoring jobs and shifting assets overseas. You do that, you pay a penalty. You don't get a reward in my plan. And use the savings from that to give companies tax credits to locate manufacturing here and manufacturing and production here in the United States. And we'll significantly ramp up the IRS enforcement against corporations who either fail to report their incomes or underreport. It's estimated that could raise hundreds of billions of dollars. All this adds up to more than what I proposed to spend in just 15 years. It's honest. It's fiscally responsible. And by the way, as the experts will tell you, it reduces the debt, the federal debt, over the long haul. But let me be clear. These are my ideas on how to pay for this plan. If others have additional ideas, let them come forward. I'm open to other ideas, so long as they do not impose any tax increase on people making less than $400,000. Let me close with this. Historically, infrastructure had been a bipartisan undertaking, many times led by Republicans. It was Abraham Lincoln who built the Transcontinental Railroad. Dwight Eisenhower, Republican, the interstate highway system. I could go on. And I don't think you'll find a Republican today in the House or Senate, maybe I'm wrong, gentlemen, who doesn't think we have to improve our infrastructure. They know China and other countries are eating our lunch. So there's no reason why it can't be bipartisan again. The divisions of the moment shouldn't stop us from doing the right thing for the future. I'm going to bring Republicans into the Oval Office, listen to them, what they have to say, and be open to other ideas. We'll have a good faith negotiation with any Republican who wants to help get this done. But we have to get it done. I truly re believe we're in a moment where history is going to look back on this time as a fundamental choice having been made between democracies and autocracies. You know, there's a lot of autocrats in the world who think the reason why they're going to win is democracies can't reach consensus any longer. Autocracies do. That's what competition between America and China and the rest of the world is all about. It's a basic question. Can, can democracies still deliver for their people? Can they get a majority? I believe we can. I believe we must. Delivering for the American people is what the American Rescue Plan was all about. And it's been overwhelmingly popular when I wrote it. Everybody said I had no bipartisan support. Or overwhelming bipartisan support were Republican, registered Republican voters. And ask around. If you live in a town with a Republican mayor, a Republican county executive, or a Republican governor, ask them how many would rather get rid of the plan. Ask them if it helped them at all. It's what the American Job Plan is about, the new one I'm proposing. I hope Republicans in Congress will join this effort. I hope and I believe a number of businesses will join this effort. And I hope and believe the American people will join this effort. Democrats, Republicans, and independents, we can do this. We have to do this. We will do this. We just have to remember this is the United States of America. And have said it a thousand times. There's Please join the conversation. Put your comments and suggestions together. below in the comment section. Thank you for subscribing to this news channel. You will be notified of any breaking news and new post as you become part and parcel of the McCad TV family. Please like and share McCad TV. We love you all.
Please support MCAD TV Foundation by joining membership and visiting Amazon UK to purchase the displayed books to aid our orphanage projects across Africa.